He holds a diploma in architectural engineering degree from Technische Universität Braunschweig and an MRC from Princeton, where he studied as a German academic exchange fellow. He's a registered architect in the Netherlands. I'm sure there's a story behind that. There, there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and has worked in firms in Europe and the United States, including Lisa Architecture, Atelier Le Lyon, maybe? Lyon. And this curious firm with the initials OMA. <laughs> OMA. Small firm, Grandma. Rotterdam. Grandma. Yeah. Mm. And has been a project leader uh, with WW and Atelier Kempe Thrill in Rotterdam. His own work includes the curation and design of numerous exhibitions, a winning proposal for the compound urban block in Syracuse, and the experimental film space in San Marcos. Are we going to see some of that? No. no. It's the, the next, the next forum. He is currently co-editor of, of a publication called Architecture in the City, Berlin Tempelhof Alternative Futures, uh, which situates the urban artifact in a decommissioned airport, Berlin Tempelhof, within a few li larger urban discourse. Hefish has held academic positions at Rice, Syracuse School of Architecture, and UT Austin, where he currently teaches comprehensive design. Anyone knows, anyone who's been around Martin or taken his studio or watched him in action, know that he's an absolute uh, dynamo of <laughs> love and knowledge about architecture, and I'm very, very keen to hear his talk, which should go ideally 40, 45 minutes, so there's some questions. Okay. Have. Thank you, Martin. Good. <laughs> well, do I have a mic to get the... Oh, I should use it. Here. Oh. Everybody can hear me. Um, thanks, Michael, for the introduction, and um, thank you also to everyone who came. I'm sort of a little intimidated by the large crowd, I have to say. I thought it was sort of like a small kind of a familiar forum, um, but I hope it will be okay. Um, so um, I also want to extend my thanks to um, Leora and, as I said, especially Michael for sort of giving me the opportunity today to uh, sort of up my modest presence at the school. Um, some of you may know me from studio. I've been sort of around for a couple of semesters. Um, teaching. So so this for me is really um, a great opportunity to actually sort of share um, some of the things that I do outside of studio when I'm not teaching um, and sort of share some of my kind of obsessions um, and interests um, at the moment. Um, really, so the, the title, um, The Potential of Ghost Form, Ghost Form, I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail what that actually is. Um, the, I think the subtitle sort of gives you a slight hint of what's at stake um, with this um, concept that I've sort of been um, looking into recently. Um, the presentation is largely divided into two parts, sort of a little experimental in a format. In the first part, I will sort of lay out some of the conceptual underpinnings, projections, um, and potentials of this concept. And then the second part, I'm going to show a couple of my own projects um, that sort of revolved around kind of these three categories, containers, agglomerations, and figures. Um, the, the topic of ghost form was really something that, as I said, has been sort of on my mind for a while. It started sort of as a paper that I gave at a recent ACSA conference. Um, and then there was an article that was published um, in the Italian The Plan Journal. Um, that I think sort of the first part really is, is in some ways a summary of kind of some of the arguments I'm making. Um, for those of you who are interested, the, the whole article is available online at theplanjournal.com, um, or you can sort of leave it. So the concept of ghost form really is, in German, literally means nothing less than, than large form, nothing more, nothing less. Um, and it's it's really an idea that was put forward by the German architect um, Oswald Matthias Ungers, who you see here, in the 1960s. Um, and in it, he sort of reimagines the singular architectural intervention at a scale between architecture and urbanism, as a countermeasure um, to sort of processes of rapid urbanization that were brought about by Europe's post-war boom. This is another project. So, so I would argue that that has been a very consistent topic in his architecture, but my interest is less biographical or historical, but rather 
um, driven by the idea that, that this idea of gross form may serve today as a template um, to address some of the current problems that cities um, are facing. So what are these problems? Um, there's a guy who founded this weird pro uh, this weird office in Rotterdam, Oma, like the grandmother project. And he wrote an article um, in the 90s, Whatever Happened to Urbanism? And so I'm going to start with this quote um, that I think is very telling. This century has been a losing battle with the issue of quantity. Um, so in his essay, Kohlhaas, <laughs> pretty enthusiastically, as is, as is his way, declares the death of urbanism in the light of the sheer quantity of and production of buildings. So urbanism for him is really sort of drowning in a proliferation of architecture, ever more architecture. What he predicts um, sort of in the 90s is a process or is, is, is an era that, that will be concerned with fields, processes, expanding boundaries and flows. And I think his um, prediction has actually proven remarkably accurate um, in many ways. Um, that uh, the last 20 years really sort of have been this um, surge, a testament to the search for renewed a urban agency through kind of the informal project, the soft project, um, and a manipulation of processes and infrastructures. Um, I, this is like, I'm really proud of this because this is actually sort of like a little advertisement for um, one of our next speakers in the lecture series, Mason White um, of Lateral Office. And this is sort of like a pamphlet architecture that they published, I think, in 2010 or 11. Um, and, and so I think this is a practice that I think is, is sort of stands very much in this tradition of what I would call the kind of soft project of architecture. So a project that really responds to the failures of traditional planning methods by focusing on networks, infrastructures, and flows, and on the way sort of generally expanding the definition of what architecture is. Um, I personally am, I do think it's a valid project very much. Um, I, I personally am interested in sort of like the other um, slightly less known trajectory, what, what I call the hard project, um, which is sort of like a project that kind of insists on the relationship between the formal object and the city and is characterized by sort of a dialectic relationships between object and fabric, bounded forms, um, there's sort of like opposition between architecture and infrastructure and a general sort of contraction. Um, and, and O.M. Ungers was very much sort of a part of this trajectory in architecture. Um, both projects initially sort of start with the same goal, which is to really formulate an adequate response to sort of um, increasing formal disintegration of cities, which is a process that was sort of very much exacerbated in the 90s by sort of digital um, um, sort of the digital arrival of the digital project um, and globalization. So at the time when Kohlhaas wrote this article, um, but I think it was also already present in the 60s. And the, the general outlines of this process were visible enough for architects to sort of like spark a sort of renewed search for kind of an urban agency in architecture. One of the projects that sort of I use as a stand in here um, for this kind of soft, the emergence of the soft project is exemplified by Kandilis Josic Wood's um, project for Berlin's Free University, um, where architecture is less of a discrete buildings, but rather a system that forms a sort of coherent habitat. So it was very much through this type of architecture in Berlin, actually, that um, O.M. Ungers, the young O.M. Ungers, um, who had become a professor of architecture at the Berlin um, Technical University in 1964, um, developed sort of a lifelong interest in issues of urbanism. Um, here at, in Berlin, he sort of started his tenure um, by um, sort of developing a new publication series of small pamphlets by, by today's standards, like your really crude pamphlets, but, but super fascinating. I would recommend like if you ever get your hands on one of those, I think they're really sort of fascinating little documents um, <laughs> that sort of combined research, student work, um, proposals for projects by himself. Um, and within this series of pamphlets, um, the, the fifth pamphlet, issue number five, was entitled Großformen im Wohnungsbau, literally meaning large form um, in housing. Um, this pamphlet really sort of stands out, I think, among the other pamphlets um, in that for the first time, really Ungers <laughs> tries to formulate a coherent position for architectural action in response to 
what Cole has sort of called this battle um, with the issue of quantity. Um, it starts, and I think this is a fascinating sort of first opening page, um, starts with a sort of small diagram that illustrates kind of a thought experiment, the one on the on the right. Um, Unger says sort of um, when um, the 8 million living units built between 1950 and 65 were given architectural form, they would cover 500 kilometers of highway between Hamburg and Frankfurt in a building 100 stories tall. So I think this this image really sets up an interesting um, and a pretty unique position at the time um, regarding the relationship between architecture and infrastructure. They, they Unger sees them as comparable in scale of production and volume, but he doesn't equate them. So for him, really, the central question becomes um, whether these quantities at which architecture is being produced can um, produce new qualities. So gross form. For him, is the architectural response to the scalar jump in infrastructures that are caused by mass production, population growth, um, and increased mobility. Um, this response for him is, although it means gross, large, but it's actually less about size, actual size, but mostly about formal cohesion. So he includes um, the um, Villa Casa Malaparte by Alberto Libera as a project that he would classify as a gross form um, when he says that gross form can be a house as much as a block, a district, or an entire city. Um, so for him, gross is a quality that's actually rather inclusive than sort of referring to absolute size um, and refers to sort of like a, a general formal legibility of a concept, in this case, kind of the concept of the stair and the plateau that um, forms this building. Um, formal coherence for Angus resides mostly in sort of like these four points that he lays out, um, the existence of an over-accentuated element, element, in this case, kind of the stair, um, the existence of an additional binding element, the existence of a figure and a theme, and the existence of a system or an ordering principle. Um, he continues in the pamphlet to kind of lay out um, sort of four basic categories of ghost forms, street, plateau, wall, and tower, um, which is then sort of like followed up by an extensive catalog um, of architects, sort of pre-war, post-war, sort of mostly modern architects, a couple of historical examples um, to sort of like fill in kind of these classifications. Um, what's interesting, again, sort of to come back to this relationship to of architecture and infrastructure is that he um, classifies a lot of sort of elements that would normally be seen as infrastructural arguments, such as street, um, simply as a continuous linear element, or a plateau um, as an expansive ordering element. So, so really, there's a certain containment of infrastructure within, the, within these kind of typical formal categories, which I think is very different from many of his contemporaries in the 1960s. Um, so for Angers, the impact, the urban impact of Großform resides less in its sort of programmatic um, operation, but in the formal legibility that's associated with it. So for him, the, the cognitive process of reading architecture as a fundamental visual act sort of allows the intervention to become a charged presence in the city that directly appeals to the observer's um, capability for conceptual synthesis. Um, so when he talks about architecture as a wall, funnel, or carpet, um, these means are sort of like intended to establish architecture as separate from the sort of more managerial infrastructural aspects of the city. Um, this is sort of a later image, like he would go full on metaphorical at, at a later date, but I think gross form sort of like remains in this kind of state where it's not really metaphorical, but rather aimed at conceptual architectural legibility. Um, so this, this really marks the beginning kind of, of a move away from a systemic thinking about the city um, that characterized much of the sort of like late modern project. But it also stops short of sort of either a sort of like obsession with sort of like the formal processes of formation, such as Eisenman, or sort of the kind of narratives, the, na the, the obsession with narrative fragments that I sort of like um, kind of use here as kind of stand-ins. Um, um, 
I argue that really the potential of prose form lies mostly in sort of two sets of dialectics that it sets up. One is a dialectic between the architectural object and the city, um, and the other one is a dialectic that happens within the architectural object itself. Um, the first one, so between object and city, is exemplified in this project that Ungers did for the Tiergartenviertel in Berlin, which was a competition entry for a city area in Berlin um, that was that was really sort of like marked by various degrees of disconnect, most notably um, the disconnect between the official desire to develop this area in a coherent way, um, but then also its de facto locations at the periphery of what was then West Berlin, really close to the wall, and a sort of urban wasteland in limbo. Um, Ungers counters this sort of like West Berlin 60s paralysis um, with um, sort of the transformative energy of a number of point interventions. So a series of five interventions that each respond and act upon a specific urban condition. So each, and, and by the way, um, Rem Kohlhaas was part of that um, competition team at the time. So there's like, that's that's a whole different narrative, but there, there are some very, very interesting kind of overlaps. Um, so each object in this context aggressively transforms its immediate context. So all interventions appear suspended between a commitment to a larger whole um, and the dedication to their respective sites. Um, they sort of share a language of abstract eras um, abrasiveness, kind of the gridded um, nature of kind of these very abstract objects that sort of makes them legible as a whole. Um, but they never really move beyond sort of a collection of objects in this site. Um, this project, I think, is interesting because it comments as much as it acts. So it comments on the impossibility in this particular urban area to come up with a totalizing concept of this kind of part of the city. Um, on the other hand, um, this sort of paralysis is really countered with, with quite what are quite aggressive um, sort of architectural moves that radically transform um, some of the specific sites um, where these objects are placed. Um, he would later develop this idea of the kind of dialectic city, a city made of different parts um, in sort of a book that's called The Dialectic City, from which this quote is taken. The city made, of, of complement made, made up of complementary places consists of the largest possible variety of different parts in each of which a special urban aspect is developed with a view to the whole. In a sense, it is a system of the city within the city. Every part has its own special features without, however, being complete or self-contained, and therefore combines with other highly developed places to form a complex system, a kind of federation. Um, the best known manifestation of this kind of dialectic city is probably um, in his own work, um, the project The City in the City, Berlin as Green Archipelago, which sort of was a 1977 project, an outcome of a Cornell Summer Academy that he taught, again, together with um, Rem Kohlhaas, um, who there, there's a new book out recently on this project, which sort of really traces the genesis of this project, um, where um, the, the team sort of transforms Berlin's greatest weakness, which is the lack of formal coherence into its greatest asset um, by sort of like literally proposing to tear down large parts um, and reducing Berlin to kind of a federation of islands, each of which um, has kind of a very, very distinct formal and homological character. Um, and these are sort of like the um, drawings that they generated. And what results is really sort of like a collection of um, kind of pieces that are retroactively idealized um, as fragments of ideal cities and that allow sort of to coexist um, in this urban void. And you can sort of see here two, two, sort of two extremes, um, Leonidov's um, linear city um, and um, the Baroque Weinbrenner's Baroque plan of Karlsruhe as two very different visions of a city that coexist um, in this um, concept of the archipelago. So the archipelago 
has been written about fairly extensively um, as sort of this idea of the dialectic city. Um, but I think there is a much less acknowledged component in the promise of ghost form. Um, what I would call the dialectic object um, in reference to the dialectic city, um, which, which I'll sort of lay out. Um, this is the last page of the pamphlet, and I think this is in some ways the most important one, um, in some ways the thesis statement. Um, when Unger says that, or he answers his own rhetorical question, why Großform, um, by saying Großform creates a framework, the order and the planned space for an unpredictable, unplanned for spontaneous process for a parasitic architecture. Without this component, any planning remains rigid and lifeless. Um, so this capacity of the formal um, container is illustrated by him with this image of the medieval city of Arles, where um, the former arena, Roman arena, is occupied by the parasitic architecture of housing. I think this, this image is really worthwhile looking at for, I think, two or three reasons, really. First of all, it expands on the separation of program and form. So architecture, form, like the, the um, circular form, is in some ways a present sui generis, so in its own right, that enables a new set of social possibilities precisely because it rises above programmatic determinations. So i.e. getting eaten by lions in a Roman arena versus medieval housing um, as kind of two extremes that are sort of um, embraced. Um, it also introduces the component of change over time. So this framework of the arena allows, in a way, to bridge the difference between the monumental architecture of imperial Rome um, with a sort of medieval um, residential fabric. And third, it blurs really the distinction between what an object and what fabric is. So put it another way, it allows gross form to exist simultaneously as an object and a city. Um, a project that he uses to illustrate, or that, that I use to illustrate his this, this sort of dialectic object is the project that the first image was sort of like a redrawing of, um, which is a pretty unassuming um, designed for an expansion of a museum um, in Germany, Mosbroich, um, where in an analogy to Arles, um, a thickened elliptical wall determines a sort of elliptical um, formal outline. The internal logic, structural and so on, is then gradually subjected to a series of transformations that allow to accommodate very, very different programs, such as housing, a cafe, an art school, and exhibition space. Um, so Morthbright really approaches the problem of this sort of like coexistence of difference um, in a way that, that I think could be described almost as the inverse of um, the Tiergarten Viertel, um, where Berlin's absence of coherence sort of prompts an overemphasis on individual parts. Here he starts from the whole and then slowly subverts the whole from within to sort of achieve this um, balance. Um, I think um, these, these two projects are very much at the extreme ends of what goes form, the spectrum of goes form. Um, one last project that I'm going to show by Owen Mungers is a project that I think combines both of these relationships, object, city, and then object and within the object, um, simultaneously. Um, and, and as such sort of stands there as what I think is quite a remarkable almost object, um, which is a project for Cologne's Grünzug Süd, um, or Southern Greenbelt, um, which results from competition to develop a suburban area um, in Cologne. And the design is actually contains mostly housing, um, is sort of uses a linear organizing principle of the wall. Um, that spans across several blocks and thus sort of as an object reinforces, really reinforces the edge of the city towards um, the park, which, which is sort of not represented here. It's the southern part. Um, at the same time, 
this larger structure is then divided into segments that are each kind of developed um, as very, very different, um, almost contextual um, pieces. So what this operation is, is actually quite similar to what he does in Mossboich. Um, what's interesting here is that the cues that he takes for the development of each of these segments are highly contextual. So he identifies moments, existing moments in the existing urban fabric um, that he then starts to fold back into the housing typologies of these segments. So the wall object, the, the entirety of the wall, thus becomes a catalyst through which contextual clues are assembled and reinforced, um, ultimately to shape a new context. And this is um, sort of a diagram that I uh, made that really sort of starts to unpack a little bit of the kind of multiplicity of different pieces that this simple linear element of the wall um, really consists of. Um, so what's at stake here? I think um, looking back at these two essential relationships um, that the concept of Großform sets up is important for, for two reasons. And, and I'm, I'm sort of using a sort of local um, example here because I think, first of all, um, Ungers provides us with what I would call a template for an architectural urbanism. And this, to me, I see imp as important because we're sort of living in a world where increasingly um, urban strategies are facing two dilemmas. One is the dilemma of the growing city, um, where in some ways traditional planning methods have reached a sort of point where um, it's almost impossible to plan cities as a whole. Um, and the other extreme is shrinking cities, where neither financial means um, nor sort of political will is strong enough to actually implement larger master plans. And so I think the idea of thinking the city through architecture, through the single architectural interventions, is something that um, can be a very interesting template um, to address either of these situations. Secondly, and I think this is where this image comes in even more, is that um, cities today are very much developed block by block, no longer parcel by parcel. Um, and there is a real danger in losing some of the um, inherent um, diversity that the traditional city has actually accommodated through the parcel. So in some ways, this idea that the dialectic object, as I call it, embraces difference within a single intervention um, is something that is remarkably um, um, accurate or remarkably interesting with regards to how some of these larger developments could be seen. Um, I'm going to move on to the next part. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, well, um, where I'm going to show a couple of projects that I think relate in some ways to the ideas that I laid out here, um, either on the urban scale or sometimes on the scale within the single architectural interventions. Um, th these three categories, containers, agglomerations, and figures are in some ways sort of stand-ins or, or helping devices that, that help me sort of categorize certain architectural ideas to accommodate kind of difference within um, sort of projects that still can be seen as holes. Containers. The container, the beauty of the container is that it's empty. So it remains open for projections. Um, it can accommodate very different contents. And at the same time, it is a distinct formal presence with a clearly defined boundary um, and can thus become sort of a provider for very different identities. Um, the first project I'm going to show is a project that's actually not a project of my own, but I, it would be an understatement to say that this project has a huge impact on my thinking. It's a project that I worked on as a project leader with Atelier Campatil, um, which is the um, remodeling of a part of the former National Socialist um, um, Seebad Sea Resort Prora in the northern part of East Germany. Um, which was originally planned as a vacation um, complex for the working classes by the Nazis um, as part of their strength through joy um, indoctrination campaign, as I would say. Um, and 
The original structure was planned as a structure consisting of eight segments spanning 4.5 kilometers of coastline in its entirety, um, meant to accommodate 20,000 holidaymakers at the same time. Um, it was started in 1936, um, but, but um, building was actually halted um, at the beginning of World War II. Um, so this is pretty much what you see here is a, is a construction photo. Um, and that was pretty much the state in which the project was left. Um, and the office was tasked with developing a stretch um, of about 200 meters um, um, and sort of transform that into a youth hostel. Um, I won't go into all the details of the project other than saying it was, it was uh, a really, really arduous process. Um, not, not so much spatially, because the structure was very clear, but um, in terms of design. So really what we were mostly dealing with were questions of unaligned structural members um, and the question of how you get um, systems through there if you don't even know exactly where these pieces are. Um, the coordination of 650 windows whose openings neither had the same dimensions nor the same positions in the wall in relationship to the floors, which also happened to be crooked. Um, so um, it, it was it was very rewarding in a way that was actually less um, rewarding because you do a fancy design, but because you're sort of dealing with um, with quite a few of the realities of architecture that you sort of inherit. Um, the project in many ways operates as a ghost form. The entire project essentially consists of three basic elements. So there's a linear envelope spanning the coastline. There's a vertical grid that sets up a system of living cells and structure, um, and a collective street that at the second level ties everything together um, through this sort of like large, about five meter wide collective space. Um, so initially what we're dealing with is really a tight packing of individualities into a coherent form that was based very much on the concept of a linear city and sort of breathed some of the spirit of, of sort of modernism despite its Nazi heritage. Um, it was claimed or used by one ideology. This is a propaganda poster for the Strength Through Joy Nazi campaign. It was subsequently recycled by another ideology. This is a photo um, that shows the East German army um, that used parts of this complex as training grounds. Other parts were used as barracks. So for, for a long time, it was actually off limits. Um, and finally, it was rededicated um, as a sort of youth hostel and education center. By the way, if somebody asks why that stair leads up to the second floor as the main entrance, it's because that's where this interior street and the public space is. So that's that's sort of like one of the questions that everybody always asks. So um, I'm going to answer that right now. Um, but across this history, the building itself has really remained remarkably stable and accommodating and sort of embodies, I think, a formal architectural presence, um, sui generis, not unlike the Arl project that Ungers uses, which trans which really transcends ideological or even functional claims on its form. Um, this is sort of a little postscript. Um, the project sparked a development of other stretches um, of this linear structure. And you can see here how kind of it, it slowly and subsequently is currently being developed into housing, often sort of privately sold um, bit by bit, which I think in my view just reinforces this ability of kind of the linear structure to take on difference, um, including even the addition of these um, balconies in some parts, uh, which, which one could argue aesthetically um, really sort of undermine the blankness of this really strong facade. But I think the project itself um, has a strong enough formal structure to accommodate that. Um, the second project is a container at the very, very other end, opposite end of the scale spectrum, which is a small um, a small a bike shelter um, that are designed for the city of Rotterdam, um, which I think equally speaks to the power of an urban object, a singular object intervention to speak to kind of larger um, urban contexts. Um, we were approached by the city of Rotterdam to 
sort of come up with a proposal for a small bike shelter um, at the peninsula Kopfansaut in Rotterdam, um, which is a peninsula that is currently under development. This is an older aerial photograph where you see the parking lot up there. Um, now OMA actually has built a huge tower, the Rotterdam, um, and it was very much under development at the time. Um, what was fascinating about this project is really that the bicycle in Rotterdam is one of the main means of transportation. Um, so a bicycle shelter was, was actually a fascinating task to take on because um, it addressed in some ways um, a very crucial piece of urban infrastructure that was needed in order to activate some of these much, much larger forms um, on this peninsula. Um, the, the site was almost impossible on this sort of little site. So the site was squeezed between two of these larger block developments. Um, where there was almost no real space, but the spatial constraints in some ways ended up becoming very, very productive um, for us because the question in some ways became, um, how do we design an object that on the one hand has a strong formal presence in the city, but on the other hand goes away? not to clutter up that tight space. Um, so an object that fulfills its function as a bike shelter, um, but doesn't really kind of clutter up an urban space, but contains bikes. So the, the solution was, was actually a simple container. Um, it, very simple in plan, as you can see, there's, there's almost um, nothing there in plan. Um, two ramps leading down, um, bike racks, and a small kiosk. Um, so the plan really asserts in some ways the kind of objectness through the rounded corners um, that, that make this sort of object distinct from the blocks around it. Um, on the other hand, in section, the project bridges these opposite desires of kind of on the one hand generating an object and on the other hand making it go away. Um, the essential pieces of this project are a sunken concrete tub that con contains the bikes out of view, so you actually don't see them. Um, the glass perimeter provided a structure, um, so we were experimenting with, with glass as a structural element here, um, as well as a shelter um, from the weather. And then a steel construction um, holds a translucent foil roof that asserts a second datum um, on top of this project. Um, so I think the real um, impact of this very simple container is that this, this small project was really affiliated with um, the fleeting but omnipresent collective of bike riders. So, so everybody who worked there had to pass through this, this very simple um, project um, in order to get to their much larger um, buildings in which they worked. Um, I think um, it was never built, uh, it was too expensive. So it was probably the most expensive bike shelter um, <laughs> that you can ever imagine due to some of the choices, but uh, I think it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> so the next the next project is, uh, is a project for an urban block, a mixed use block um, in Fargo. Um, it's a competition design um, and the competition to us seemed interesting because there were really two uh, parameters as a starting point that we were intrigued by. One was that it called for the development of a single block. Um, so really sort of stressing kind of the contained object of the, of the urban block. <laughs> and the second one was that the program was extremely diverse um, and called for the integration of very, very different activities inside this block parameter and thus so the potential of the possibility of exploring different part whole relationships. Um, the project tries or attempts to create a civic space that is on the one hand defined by a singular gesture, um, but that is also um, able to accommodate difference within its um, confines. Um, the logic of the perimeter block is inverted. It's lifted off the ground um, to gain access to a public plaza in the middle. And then we added what we called activator volumes to this plaza that contain um, the more public programs. Um, so what results really is a sort of like outline that the project really absolves each of those types, like whether it's the small tower, 
or um, the perimeter block of some of the constraints um, and becomes in some ways neutral enough to integrate very, very different temporary collectives um, such as offices, housing, there's a fitness studio, small art gallery, um, and parking. So essentially, the project really creates a miniature city um, within the city um, on this urban block that's a clearly confined object on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, contains a lot of very different programs and conditions. Um, the differences are expressed on the outside, but they're never in your face. So rather than sort of directly showing the difference on the outside um, through a direct display of program, we aimed for using a mediator of a slatted facade um, where really the distance between the slats becomes the only um, intermediator of um, a certain differentiated activity going on inside this block. Um, structure is is visible, but on the other hand, the, the sort of like overstructuring or the use of sort of like more but thinner structure um, creates kind of a, this merging of structure and surface on the outside, um, which to us was sort of like important um, to generate something that has a certain coherence despite its um, different parts that it contains. Um, agglomerations. Um, and I'm going to show two projects that that really kind of start on the opposite. They don't start from the large form, but they really start from the smaller unit to form bigger, coherent um, projects. Um, there's, this is, again, sort of a scale jump. The first project is um, an exhibition project that I designed and for the most part actually also built with students um, <laughs> at um, Syracuse University um, that sort of displays kind of in, in an almost laboratory-like settings, explore some of these questions of the relationship between the formal object and its publics. Um, it was an exhibition that was initially meant to display the work of Stealth Unlimited, a sort of Dutch-Serbian um, architecture firm. Some of you may have heard of them, really interesting um, things. And um, pretty soon, like we, we started to subvert this idea of the straightforward exhibition. And the goal was less to display just work, but make the exhibition space itself become an active component of this show. Um, so we, we, we created this cube of 256 single boxes, 24 polycarbonate sheets, and um, a, an overhead structural grid that was hung from the gallery ceiling. Um, and the components were simple as could be, like the, the, the budget was, was ridiculously low. I'm not going to say how much it was. It was, I mean, it was, um, but um, so, so there's really just these three components um, structurally that make up the entire project. Um, then we created a calendar of different events. So we invited different um, groups from within the university, from without the university, um, to have to hold events in the gallery space. Um, we had a religious celebration, we had a career fair, we had performances, recitals, um, and, and sometimes students actually just work there. Um, and for each event, um, these polycarbonate sheets could be rehung on the overhead grid, and the stackable boxes became a kind of mini urban furniture field. Um, so what was created was really an inverse relationship between the idea of display. So as you moved polycarbonate sheets and boxes, the display cube, and I forgot to mention that, that the cube in its original state had a four-sided projection of the work of Stealth Unlimited. So that was the only um, exhibition part. And as you kind of disassembled it, um, these projections would, sh would shoot and hit different pieces of the exhibition and fragments. So there was really an inverse relationship between the activity and the function of an exhibition. Um, each of the changes were then recorded on the floor before for the next event, all of the pieces were put back together into kind of the block position. Um, the next exhibition um, is another exhibition in the same gallery space, actually. Um, that um, was an exhibition of, of various visiting critics, professors in practice at Syracuse that I was um, tasked with curating, designing, and again, mostly assembling. Um, and the, there was a dual challenge there because on the one hand, um, there were five 
di very different architectural practices in the exhibition. Um, so how do you combine different bodies of work into a coherent whole, but give each project enough breathing space? Um, the other pro the problem was that the gallery space, which was the same one as this, was reduced to a third of its original size due to renovations. Um, so there were some real spatial constraints. Um, the strategy was to drive a very graphic wedge or sort of like linear form into that very, very aggressively actually into that um, gallery space that at times is legible as a coherent object where, for example, it leads you inside the gallery and spills out into the atrium. We had a lot of discussions with the fire marshal about this, um, but it, it worked in the end. Um, and then at the other hand, like when you were inside the object kind of fragmented and you, you really had the space and the, the um, kind of looseness of the single pieces to display various um, artifacts. This is just another um, image of this. Um, the third category, I'm sort of closing in here, um, is, yes, um, is the idea of the figure um, that I think is useful because it can be used, it, it's open-ended, it can negotiate difference. Um, on the other hand, it remains understandable as a whole. Um, this is a small project um, that I did in Syracuse for what I call the compound block um, that, that really attempts to create a civic hub um, on an existing urban block in pretty much the absence of any architectural mass um, that we had to work with. Um, so the project really operates very much on a sort of surface level. Um, the block originally was occupied by a number of different pieces. There was a, um, a grocery store on the far end with the affiliated parking lot, um, and there were some remainders of kind of an urban fabric. There was a little health clinic, the, the largest piece here, that was looking to expand. Um, and that's what prompted the entire design brief. Um, it was clear from the beginning that the health clinic was something that we would never design because they had a specialist who specialized in health clinics. Um, so really, um, the project was a kind of master plan that, that didn't really leave much to work with except some of these various surface conditions, asphalt, um, gravel, grass, and so on. And the question became how do we generate sort of potentials between these surfaces, um, programmatic and formal, through the rearrangement of some of these surfaces? Um, one of the devices that we used was a kind of figural framing, um, not the building becoming the frame, but in fact, a sort of like um, what I always call gross form without mass. So a kind of green um, perimeter that connects the different pieces of fabric, um, but at the same time, um, is not actually built mass itself. Um, and then in the middle, um, there was a big space that could accommodate um, a part of the parking lot, basketball courts, farmer's market, or an open air cinema. Um, so the result is very much um, a formal plan um, where really the, the forms or the figures are formed by the surfaces in between buildings rather than the buildings themselves. Um, and, and this sort of like representation of flattening out plan and elevation information, um, we, we chose very deliberately for this project um, to signify that, that really kind of that figure works as much in elevation as in plan. Um, the last project... I'm going to show briefly is a project that um, is very much in, in the works right now. It's um, it's sort of a larger, it's actually a complex of different projects um, for the reuse of the former Berlin Tempelhof Airport. And it's as much of a research project as a design project, um, which brings us back to really the question of the urban mega figure. Um, Tempelhof is an, a former airport in the city of Berlin roughly comparable in size to Central Park in New York. It was one of the early airfields of the 1920s. Um, and the current structure, that crescent structure that you see, was designed by Ernst Zagabiel, um as part of Albert Speer's um, larger plan to transform Berlin. Um, interesting, and again, similar narrative as 
as the Prova project. It, it was a project that was essentially built by the Nazis under a sort of very new Baroque urban um, plan. On the other hand, it was a very modern airport. It was the first airport that separated flows um, from the gates or fr from the sort of hall to the gates, uh, causing Norman Foster to call it the mother of all airports. Um, and it took on very different roles. So um, for a while, it served as Berlin's lifeline to the West during the time of the Soviet blockade in 1948, 49. And I love the fact that kind of the iconic nature of this project is sort of like used by the kids um, for their playing for, for their playing field. It finally closed in 2008, um, and um, there is there's sort of ongoing debates on what's going to happen with it. it. At the moment, it is a public park; it's an open space. A master plan by the city of Berlin was voted down in a um, public referendum. Um, and so really, I think there's space, at least for speculation on what's going to happen um, with this sort of like big urban void that in its sheer size really rivals one of the other famous Berlin voids, which is the former death strip um, along the wall. However, in contrast to the former death strip, which has been sort of like subsequently filled in um, with kind of buildings that look like they were always there, um, which I think is is a huge chance that was wasted in some ways to kind of like um, keep this urban object, this urban void as something that's recognizable. I think the verdict on Tempelhof is still out. Um, so a very sort of speculative project that's, that's in progress, so the drawings that you're seeing here are sort of like versions, um, is a project that really attempts to kind of address this urban void in two ways. The first is to really um, respond to kind of a large pressure on housing in Berlin that we're experiencing at the moment. Um, so the need for new housing to be built and this obviously sort of being one of the juicy sites um, of intervention. But on the other hand, the project also strives to maintain the kind of formal legibility, the figural nature of this elliptical original plan um, by kind of making the initial layout a sort of container in which um, different kinds of housing fabric could find their um, place and sort of like provide a very, very large um, and, and sort of diverse. He holds a diploma in architectural engineering degree from Technische Universität Braunschweig and an MRC from Princeton, where he studied as a German academic exchange fellow. He's a registered architect in the Netherlands. I'm sure there's a story behind that. There, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and has worked in firms in Europe and the United States, including Lisa Architecture, Atelier Le Lyon, maybe? Lyon. And this curious firm with the initials O N A. O N A. Small firm. Grandma. Rotterdam. Grandma. Yeah. Mm. And has been a project leader uh, with WW and Atelier Kempe Thrill in Rotterdam. His own work includes the curation and design of numerous exhibitions, a winning proposal for the compound urban block in Syracuse, and the experimental film space in San Marcos. Are we going to see some here? No. Well, it's the next, the next forum. He is currently co-editor of, of a publication called Architecture in the City, Berlin Tempelhof Alternative Futures, uh, which situates the urban artifact in a decommissioned airport, Berlin Tempelhof, within a few li larger urban discourse. Hetish has held academic positions at Rice, Syracuse School of Architecture and UT Austin, where he currently teaches comprehensive design. Anyone knows, anyone who's been around Martin or taken his studio or watched him in action, know that he's an absolute uh, dynamo of <laughs> love and knowledge about architecture. And I'm very, very keen to hear his talk, which should go ideally 40, 45 minutes. So there's some questions. Okay. Have. Thank you, Martin. Good. Well, do I have a mic to get the oh, I should have used it.
Yes, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thanks, Michael, for the introduction. And um, thank you also to everyone who came. I'm sort of a little intimidated by the large crowd, I have to say. I thought it was sort of like a small kind of a familiar forum. Um, but I hope it will be OK. Um, so um, I also want to extend my thanks to um, Leora and, as I said, especially Michael for sort of giving me the opportunity today to uh, sort of up my modest presence at the school. Um, some of you may know me from studio. I've been sort of around for a couple of semesters um, teaching. So, so this for me is really um, a great opportunity to actually sort of share um, some of the things that I do outside of studio when I'm not teaching um, and sort of share some of my kind of obsessions um, and interests um, at the moment. Um, really, so the, the title, um, The Potential of Ghost Form. Ghost Form, I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail what that actually is. Um, the, I think the subtitle sort of gives you a slight hint of what's at stake um, with this um, concept that I've sort of been um, looking into recently. Um, the presentation is largely divided into two parts, sort of a little experimental in a format. In the first part, I will sort of lay out some of the conceptual underpinnings, projections, um, and potentials of this concept. And then the second part, I'm going to show a couple of my own projects um, that sort of revolved around kind of these three categories, containers, agglomerations, and figures. Um, the, the topic of ghost form was really something that, as I said, has been sort of on my mind for a while. It started sort of as a paper that I gave at a recent ACSA conference. Um, and then there was an article that was published um, in the Italian The Plan Journal um, that I think sort of so the first part really is, is in some ways a summary of kind of some of the arguments I'm making. Um, for those of you who are interested, the, the whole article is available online at theplanjournal.com, um, or you can sort of leave it. So the concept of ghost form really is, in German, literally means nothing less than, than large form, nothing more, nothing less. Um, and it's, it's really an idea that was put forward by the German architect um, Oswald Matthias Ungers, who you see here, in the 1960s. Um, and in it, he sort of reimagines the singular architectural intervention at a scale between architecture and urbanism as a countermeasure um, to sort of processes of rapid urbanization that were brought about by Europe's post-war boom. This is another project. So, so I would argue that that has been a very consistent topic in his architecture. But my interest is less biographical or historical, but rather um, driven by the idea that, that this idea of ghost form may serve today as a template um, to address some of the current problems that cities um, are facing. So what are these problems? Um, there's a guy who founded this weird, pro uh, this weird office in Rotterdam, Uma, like the grandmother project. And he wrote an article um, in the 90s, Whatever Happened to Urbanism? And so I'm going to start with this quote um, that I think is very telling. This century has been a losing battle with the issue of quantity. Um, so in his essay, Kohlhaas, pretty enthusiastically, as is, as is his way, declares the death of urbanism in the light of the sheer quantity of and production of buildings. So urbanism for him is really sort of drowning in a proliferation of architecture, ever more architecture. What he predicts um, sort of in the 90s is a process or is, is, is an era that, that will be concerned with fields, processes, expanding boundaries and flows. And I think his um, prediction has actually proven remarkably accurate um, in many ways. Um, that uh, the last 20 years really sort of have been this um, surge, a testament to the search for renewed a urban agency through kind of the informal project, the soft project, um, and a manipulation of processes and infrastructures. Um, I, this is like, I'm really proud of this because this is actually sort of like a little advertisement for um, one of our next speakers in the lecture series, Mason White um, of Lateral Office. And this is sort of like a pamphlet architecture that they published, I think, in 2010 or 11. Um, and, and so I think this is a practice that I think is, is sort of stands very much in this tradition of what I would call the kind of soft project of architecture. So a project that really responds to the failures of traditional planning methods by focusing on networks, infrastructures, and flows, and on the way sort of generally expanding the definition of what architecture is. 
Um, I personally am, I do think it's a valid project very much. Um, I, I personally am interested in sort of like the other um, slightly less known trajectory, what, what I call the hard project, um, which is sort of like a project that kind of insists on the relationship between the formal object and the city and is characterized by sort of a dialectic relationships between object and fabric, bounded forms. Um, there's sort of like opposition between architecture and infrastructure and a general sort of contraction. Um, and and O.M. Ungers was very much sort of a part of this trajectory in architecture. Um, both projects initially sort of start with the same goal, which is to really formulate an adequate response to sort of um, increasing formal disintegration of cities, which is a process that was sort of very much exacerbated in the 90s by sort of digital, um, um, sort of the, digital, the arrival of the digital project um, and globalization. So at the time when Kohlhaas wrote this article, um, but I think it was also already present in the 60s. And the, the general outlines of this process were visible enough for architects to sort of like spark a sort of renewed search for kind of an urban agency in architecture. One of the projects that sort of I use as a stand in here um, for this kind of soft, the emergence of the soft project is exemplified by Kandilis Josic Wood's um, project for Berlin's Free University, um, where architecture is less of a discrete buildings, but rather a system that forms a sort of coherent habitat. So it was very much through this type of architecture in Berlin, actually, that um, O.M. Mungers, the young O.M. Mungers, um, who had become a professor of architecture at the Berlin um, Technical University in 1964, um, developed sort of a lifelong interest in issues of urbanism. Um, here, in Berlin, he sort of started his tenure um, by um, sort of developing a new publication series of small pamphlets by, by today's standards, like your really crude pamphlets, but but super fascinating. I would recommend like if you ever get your hands on one of those, I think they're really sort of fascinating little documents um, that sort of combined research, student work, um, proposals for projects by himself. Um, and within this series of pamphlets, um, the, the fifth pamphlet, issue number five, was entitled Großformen im Wohnungsbau, literally meaning large form um, in housing. Um, this pamphlet really sort of stands out, I think, among the other pamphlets um, in that for the first time, really, Ungers <laughs> tries to formulate a coherent position for architectural action in response to what Kohlhaas sort of called this battle um, with the issue of quantity. Um, it starts, and I think this is a fascinating sort of first opening page, um, starts with a sort of small diagram that illustrates kind of a thought experiment, the one on the, on the right. Um, Unger says sort of um, when um, the 8 million living units built between 1950 and 65 were given architectural form, they would cover 500 kilometers of highway between Hamburg and Frankfurt in a building 100 stories tall. So I think this, this image really sets up an interesting um, and a pretty unique position at the time um, regarding the relationship between architecture and infrastructure. They, they Unger sees them as comparable in scale of production and volume, but he doesn't equate them. So for him, really, the central question becomes um, whether these quantities at which architecture is being produced can um, produce new qualities. So Großform for him is the architectural response to the scalar jump in infrastructures that are caused by mass production, population growth, um, and increased mobility. Um, this response for him is, although it means gross, large, but it's actually less about size, actual size, but mostly about formal So he includes um, the um, Villa Casa Malaparte by Alberto Libera as a project that he would classify as a gross form um, when he says that gross form can be a house as much as a block, a district, or an entire city. Um, so for him, gross is a quality that's actually rather inclusive than sort of referring to absolute size um, and refers to sort of like a, a general formal legibility of a concept, in this case, kind of the concept of the stair and the plateau that um, forms this building. Um, 
formal coherence for Angus resides mostly in sort of like these four points that he lays out. Um, the existence of an over-accentuated element, element, in this case kind of the stair, um, the existence of an additional binding element, the existence of a figure and a theme, and the existence of a system or an ordering principle. Um, he con 